Okay, um, so this is the third um, workshop we are doing, and I'm uh, again struck by what a diverse audience we have. It's always really cool to meet people who are using the database, and I'm hoping it's going to be useful for you. Um, I'll give you a brief overview here, and all the topics I'm touching upon, we're going to go into more detail later. So also, this is not necessarily the best time to ask questions or so. There's going to be other talks that are going to go into more detail, and hopefully uh, I'm going to give you an overall picture of what the IEDB is all about. So one thing we always have to stress, I don't like this stupid dot. What is that? Uh, it has a perfectly fine mouse cursor. Okay, okay great, great. Awesome. So the bottom one. Uh, this is new. So we have this for a few minutes. Uh, okay. So uh, one thing we always have to stress, uh, the IDB is completely free. We have uh, funded by NIH. So the goal is really that um, we're going to make um, epitope information widely available for the community. And our scope is allergens, infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, and transplants and alloanalysis. So specifically, we do not do cancer, and we also do not do HIV, uh, both of which is due to uh, a funding mission of, of the institute that funds us specifically. Um, so within these uh, kind of disease categories, uh, we are capturing uh, essentially four different kinds of, of experiments namely T-cell responses to epitopes, so where T-cell recognizes an epitope presented by MHC uh, molecules, B-cell epitopes, where an antibody binds to an epitope, and uh, MHC binding and MHC-like evolution assays, which obviously are not really epitopes in terms of that they're not recognized by immune receptors, but this step of peptide binding to MHC is crucial essentially for something to become an epitope. Um, in total, at this point, we have 16,000 curated articles and direct submissions, 120,000 unique epitopes and 700,000 assays. And we're dealing with epitopes from humans, monkeys, mice, any kind of host that you can think of. Um, when we started off with, uh, we realized in order to really capture these kinds of information to characterize an epitope, it is very hard uh, to find the structure that everybody is happy with. Because people in different areas of science think of epitopes in a different way. And, uh, so in order to be agnostic to this, instead of capturing uh, some somewhat arbitrary criteria of what an epitope is, we're actually capturing the experiment that is used to map an epitope. Um, um, and I'll show you in some more detail later how we do that. Uh, and then essentially the user can then search for the characteristics of the experiment that we use to define the epitope. And then that's kind of the universal language that people tend to understand and that is common and shared between the different fields. In order to do that, what we have to do is to take the kind of list information that you find in the literature, like figures and materials and methods sections and general free text, and kind of convert this to a structured format. And so the structured format then necessarily kind of uh, is a little um, higher level, obviously, because we want to fit everything in here. But there's a lot of thinking has been going into that, and I'll just give you a brief overview. So essentially, every epitope is some kind of material entity. So an epitope can be a peptide, or an epitope can be, in the case of antibodies binding to proteins, it can be discontinuous residues in the protein sequences that are overall forming uh, an antibody binding site. Or it can be non-peptidic uh, molecules, which is exactly uh, what the collaboration with Teddy is giving us, uh, where essentially something like carbohydrates or lipids, uh, they can also be recognized by epitopes. And which are somewhat harder to describe, that's why we outsource that. Oh, I'll touch this again. Um, outsource this to uh, EDI. Um, in order for us to capture the epitope in the database, it must be described somewhere. So we have two sources of data. Uh, either something is coming from a journal article, from the literature, or it comes from an author submission, um, which is typically from funded contract. Uh, they were actually co-founded originally with the IDP, and they're mandated to submit data into the ID primarily. Um, the next most important thing about an epitope is that it comes from something. These are typically not random peptides, but they are encoded in a specific organism, like a virus or an allergen. Um, and in that organism, typically, uh, it comes from a protein, uh, or it could also be from a protein complex. You have examples where you have two different proteins binding together, and then 
So an antibody can bind somewhere in the interface of those. In order for us uh, to know about that this is actually an epitope, is as in that it's uh, targeted by immune responses, it must have been characterized in some experiment. And so examples of the main examples of the experiments is what I showed you in the last slide. So they would be B cell responses, T cell responses, or MHC uh, binding or illusion assays. And actually, whenever we say B cell or antibody, we use those synonymous. So the B cell epitope and antibody epitope is part of the same. Um, or in the case of B cells and T cells, uh, in the immune recognition that is tested in the assay, these B cells or T cells come from something. And um, essentially, there must have been some kind of priming process or immunization process that is at least assumed by the B cells or T cells tested would recognize that epitope. So, for example, when you test peptides from uh, um, Ebola virus, say, uh, you want to have someone who was infected by Ebola in order to see if uh, these peptides are actually recognized in the context of a natural infection. You have examples where you have exposure without disease. So uh, typically when you get actually uh, samples from, from an, any person in the room, you can assume that they are exposed to certain pollen, say, uh, even if they're allergic or non-allergic, actually in both cases do you make an immune response. Uh, or they could be a result of an administered immunization, meaning that you're vaccinated with a flu vaccine and you're expected obviously to react to some of the epitopes in, that are found in the vaccine. Uh, in all of these cases, we're actually trying to uh, use standardized vocabulary uh, to, to capture these kinds of things and collaborating with other people, as I mentioned uh, before, so prominently, uh, we're working with heavy on the non uh, uh molecule curation. So we started this whole thing in 2004, and at that point, there were something like 13,000 papers that were considered to be in scope for the database, so that um, that are already scanned as it's uh, uh, presumed based on the abstract to contain relevant epitope information uh, for curation. And then over the years, we have caught up and actually are now at 99% or something like 95%, 98% of all the papers that, have, that are essentially in scope are in the IADB. And so we at this point are at a, uh, uh, how do you say, a steady state. Hopefully, your things need the things coming in, the curation as they go. So, we've caught up on things in the past to the majority. Uh, I agree, obviously, obviously, people look at things and people point something out that we add to the data. But we should have, if you find something from a paper from 10 years ago that's not in the database, that's, that's the mistake and good luck. Um, so, also, essentially, we got our renewal uh, in uh, somewhere around here because that was the goal of the first uh, seven years of the contract. Uh, to get to the stage, and then NIH said, awesome, you're done. Now we can cut your funding by two-thirds because you're <laughs> it's done all the majority of the work, which is true. So, um, and so essentially based on, on this duration, we at this point have, as I mentioned, 700,000 assays, experiments, which characterize over 120,000 different episodes. They come from 60,000 papers, and we know there's a little difference here. Some of these turned out not to actually contain any relevant So. This workshop is going to be the first one where we are going to demo the IDB 3.0. So uh, we had an initial version of the database, and we did a 2.0 redesign. I mean, of the major redesign now that is just coming online, uh, which where the vast majority of things we wanted to address is to make the query interface simple. Um, so at first, we were really focusing on getting all the information, and now we have the information. And actually, in some cases, it's overwhelming right now. There's so much. Uh, things that you can pull out from a query that it becomes hard to handle, or much harder than it is when we started, where there was little information in there in the first place. So we had a lot of uh, community outreach activities, including these user workshops where we're trying to find out what works and what doesn't work to make the whole website better. And our main focus has been to so power users tend to be happy, actually, with mainly they just download the data and then do something with it themselves, but our main goal is actually to have that the most common kind of requests that people are doing to the database should be simple, and straightforward. Um, so currently, when you go to the website, there's a link to the public beta version of this 3.0 website, but we'll replace the old main website with this new uh, current uh, IDB 3.0, which is a beta, uh, by the end of 2014. So in this workshop, we'll always talk about the new website. But if you type in IDB.org, you'll go to the old website and then stick the link to the new website. But why should we talk about the website that is going to be discontinued in a few months, right? So we're focusing on the future. 
uh, yeah, and then very important, we do really want to hear, because this is beta, right? Beta, the point of the beta is we still want to hear what works and what doesn't work. Tell us, uh, yeah, uh, what's confusing uh, the goal. This should be that's less confusing than it used to be. So this is the new home page. And um, um, in the center here, you see, and that's what I'll talk about a little more, uh, uh, the search, the new and revised search interface to the right. There's also some uh, summary metrics, welcome text, and the analysis resource, which we'll talk about some more. Um, so yeah, just as an example, you, so you can query by kind of like similar to the boxes I showed you before. You can search for the uh, epitope uh, itself, like the peptide sequence, or you can search for the protein or organism where the epitope came from. You can search for the host that recognizes it, the acid that characterizes MHC restriction, and uh, type of uh, disease associated with the epitope. And then you get a result like this, where you essentially have lists of, and you can uh, switch between these tabs here, and then uh, so you have epitopes, antigens, assays, and references, which are four main kind of categories of information here. Um, another main thing that we have done in the IDB 3.0 redesign is to uh, update uh, these finders that you'll find throughout the, the web page. So we've tried to, wherever possible, to add a hierarchical organization and make this as simple as possible. Um, so, for example, we used to have we used to have hierarchical organizations before, but for example, we relied straightforward on the NCBI taxonomy as our classification of organisms. And the NCBI taxonomy, if you've ever looked at it, it's great uh, because uh, I mean specifically because every protein in any NCBI or Uniprot will have an, an, an annotation what organism comes from this uh, taxonomy. But because they have to do with everything, it's also really, really, really even nested. So as a challenge, you can try to find human by navigating down 30 steps among very weird taxonomic classifications that you have never heard of. So we essentially made a simpler classification, focusing on the kinds of things, uh, so, so, so like, like, like uh, seed plants or, or grasses uh, that actually people uh, know something about. And there's like, like 10 levels or something in between these two, which people normally would not. So the other main uh, um, uh, new thing that we've done is uh, try to uh, derive aggregate views. So here you have a picture of the immuno browser, which we'll describe in more detail. In this case, you have along the protein sequence uh, and, uh, some, uh, a measure of immunogenicity uh, of, of multiple peptides coming from many studies. So the advantage of these kinds of views is when you query for some proteins that are very well studied, uh, such as uh, whatever, HCV or something like that, you're getting tens of thousands of different experiments that have been performed. And that list of tens of thousands of experiments is going to be so overwhelming that you're actually not going to learn anything from, from that list. And uh, the goal here is to kind of aggregate this information and uh, because also uh, different experiments will have different uh, um, outcomes. If you work with humans, humans are different. Uh, you need to kind of aggregate this information and have an overall view of, of the results. In addition to these changes to the uh, interfaces, something that is ongoing always is recuration. So we, over time, we've adjusted all the rules, how we enter data into the database, try to be more exact. Um, and as we introduce new rules, uh, we kind of have to go back to the older papers and then fix the stuff that we have entered before. Um, also, we're trying to, as much as possible, improve data consistency. So in this demo case, we have data that was in free text before, that we then, once we have enough data in there, we understand what are the typical choices and then replace them with a uniform uh, catalog values. Yeah, um, the overall the result of this is that we are over time, and so if you're wondering sometimes why something changed that was curated 10 years ago, that is typically then because we've gone back and recurated some of these fields uh, in order to improve the accuracy and consistency of the data and the data. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have as one source the epitope discovery contracts, not just the literature. And this slide is actually out of date, but the new contracts were just awarded last week and it's still not completely clear to us who's doing what. Um, so but essentially there's a number of contracts that are managed to uh, deposit the data that they're generating into the new database. And several of these is like the, the third round of our funding. So a lot of data has been generated by these and uh, about 27% of the whole data in the IDB comes from these contracts. Um, data deposit is open to the general public. 
Um, you have to actually always ask in AIG, are they happy with this? Are spending time on it? But they have been, I don't know if it has been a case where we said no. Uh, so I think yeah, so far we've taken it. Uh, uh, in addition to these uh, submissions, one of the things we are trying to do to uh, uh, reach out to the community is once we have completed a certain area of curation, um, we are performing meta-analysis. Uh, like uh, um, essentially, we are trying to describe in totality the epitope knowledge in a certain area. So one of the first examples was an influenza analysis, and the most recent ones are uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, pertussis um, that we performed this year. Okay. And the goal here is uh, to, to give an overview and then give this to the experts and say, hey, this is what we believe is known currently about the pattern episodes. What do you think? And then quite often they say, well, uh, um, I thought much more is known in this area. And we go back and look, uh, we find more papers that we missed maybe. And also, how can we better uh, present these results and what is the specific vocabulary used in different communities to present these kinds of uh, data? So that helps us ultimately to improve the database itself. Uh, that this uh, meta-analysis is one part how we try to reach out and promote awareness of the IDD. Another thing where you're sitting in right now, you're uh, currently bathing in or something. Uh, yeah, we are organizing these user workshops. Uh, we're also going to um, conferences and try to be at uh, exhibit booths four times a year, which is nice that people can come up and talk to us. Uh, that's also where we always have to write free as large as possible because they always think we might sell them something. Um, and we're trying to publish papers in general, also as a way to kind of advertise how can the IDD be utilized. And we welcome people who do very similar things in, in their uh, own area. So um, that's ultimately what we want to achieve. And then we have a video and written tutorial um, that we are trying to update. We need to update now. Right. Way for the 3.0 release, they're all going to be kind of yeah, more or less badly out of date. So in this user workshop, we have two main goals. So one is we want your input to make the IDP app better. So you didn't realize this, but we have brought you on here so that we benefit from it. Uh, so we want to learn how real people use the IDP. It's always easy for us to come up with something that's a useful feature. We'd much rather know what actual people who use the database. Uh, feel is dismissing and what actual people are doing uh, with the data. Uh, and also that then officially leads us to prioritization and identifying problems that we currently have and what, what can we improve. But obviously also uh, we want uh, to enable you to get the most of the IDP. Our success metric, we get more uh, uh, funding renewed if uh, more people use the database. So for us, the metric of success is usage and the best compliment for us is if you come up with a paper we have nothing to do with uh, that size the IDB and then you can say this, this helped us write this paper. So that's, that's for us, that's like that. Uh, so uh, finishing off with this slide. So I'm hoping I've shown you that um, the IDB deals with experimental data of these kinds of types is that it's deposited in the IDB. Tomorrow we'll talk how that data is used in the analysis resource to derive prediction tools and to analyze the analysis tools. And um, yeah, this summarizes hopefully how the IDB and it will help you. So that, uh, as I said, I probably unless there's something burning, I would like to not have a question and just move on to the next talk where all of this is working. Okay. Yeah.